Good morning, church family. If you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 3. That's where we're going to begin our Sunday school this morning. Uh, while you're turning there, I just want to say that uh, it's been different being home and only being able to go between here and the church building. But Alex and I have been trying to make the most of it, trying to stay in contact with all of you through phone calls, text messages, and emails. Just miss you all. Looking forward to things getting back to normal, but we can survive the time that we're apart. Thank goodness for, or thank God for modern technology and the ability to connect via email and social media. And this is one of the few times that I will ever be grateful for social media, but right now I am. And also YouTube and live streaming and audio recording and all these other things that we can do. So it's great. There's so many things to be grateful for, so many things to be thankful for. As far as I know, nobody in the church right now is in the hospital. Any, really, our county so far has been blessed with very few infections, and what we're doing is working, and that's great. So, grateful for that. Let's dive into God's Word and see what He has to share with us this morning. Well, in James chapter 3, starting in verse 1, we're just going to read verse 1 because it's a heavy verse. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. This is one of those verses that every preacher thinks about all the time. Any Sunday school teacher thinks about all the time. And not just adult Sunday school teachers, but children Sunday school teachers too. In fact, there's verses like this in the Bible that you understand why they're there. Because teachers need to take what they're doing very seriously and need to be prepared and need to know what they're saying is truthful to the best of their knowledge. At the same time, you could understand why these verses might discourage some. And although I don't think that's the point, it may actually serve a purpose in that at least people may be more careful before they decide to go into this kind of a leadership role, or really, in my opinion, any leadership role at all, you have to understand that it's serious. And that what you teach and what you say will indeed incur a stricter judgment. Some other translations say a double judgment. Uh, there's variety on the exact wording. But just the idea that there's not supposed to be too many teachers. That's what the beginning of the verse says. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. This kind of reminds me of the old piece of wisdom that you don't want too many cooks in the kitchen. You don't want a hundred opinions about things, especially in the same organization, even the same business, and most especially in the same church. You want more than one opinion. And you should be able to have discussions. In fact, I'm a huge fan of discussions. When I was younger, I enjoyed arguing and debating. I don't enjoy that at all now. But I definitely want to hear from people who disagree with me uh, or disagree with, with something. And let's talk about it. And here's the thing that I think is so helpful when it comes to disagreements. And there's two steps. One, you have to be willing to discuss it. And two, you have to be willing to give it time. I think both of those things are very important for resolving conflict. So many times when conflict comes, there's a demand for it to be solved immediately. Only the devil's in a hurry. I just can't repeat that enough. If it's a good idea today, it'll be a good idea tomorrow, or next week, or even next month. Patience is a biblical value that is not in conflict with trying to get something right. In fact, it is in harmony with it. If you want to get something right, you cannot rush to judgment. So many times, and I mean so many times with so many people, and, I, and I, I've been this way, where you're just absolutely convinced something is correct and you demand it to be in place now. Well, here's the deal. Just in the off chance you or I might happen to be wrong, 
then we violated two biblical principles instead of just one. So again, it's so important that if we disagree, let's discuss it and let's give it time. It took me years to accept certain biblical truths. That's the truth. And I can recognize that now, and I tell other people that now, because I'll have other people get so frustrated that they explain something from Scripture. It's as plain as day. Absolutely, it's logical. It makes sense, etc. But if you don't give people time, it doesn't sink in. And if you don't give people time, they feel like they're being pushed, they feel like they're being forced or shamed or guilted, then all of that emotion is working against you, and you got to know people. Emotion goes a long way towards persuasion. In fact, I believe there's very few, if any people at all, that could be convinced of an argument purely on logic. Almost everybody requires some kind of emotional validation, some kind of persuasive characteristic. There's an old illustration I've used many times, but I think it's really worth repeating because it's so helpful. Let's say your friend is going to prepare for you your favorite meal the meal that you like most of all, and he has prepared that meal. And let's just say for the sake of argument, even if it's not your favorite meal, just follow the, the course of the illustration. Let's say it's a steak and mashed potatoes and green beans and uh, a drink. Let's say that favorite meal is being served to you. You go to their house. You're looking forward to it. You get there. And there's this vessel on the table, sort of this large glass, and it's filled with this strange substance. You don't know what it is. And your best friend comes in and says, there's your meal. And you're like, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, I made it just like you like it, but I thought, so I just put it all in a blender. It's, it's, it's even the same temperature as we would normally make it. It's just all mixed together and blended together. You should like it almost the same, right? Well, the truth is, and all of us know this, it's not only less appealing, it's inedible. We don't want it at all. Well, that's what it's like when you serve truth with nothing but logic and no love and no patience. If you want to be an effective teacher or preacher, you have to not only preach and teach truth, you have to do so persuasively. And that doesn't mean emotional manipulation. That doesn't mean tricking anybody into anything. What it does mean is showing them love, showing them patience, and showing them respect. And you do those things with truth, and over time, you'll find it to be effective. All right, I think we've got through that verse. Let's continue. And the rest of the passage isn't just about teachers and preachers, uh, for sure. It's really about everybody. So here we go. Verse 2, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bride the whole, bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Whew. I'll admit, when I was studying this this week, I was not looking forward to teaching on this passage. There are some passages that just strike so deep that convict you so much that it hurts. And this is one of them. Because as somebody who likes to talk and visit, as somebody who speaks probably two to three times more than the average person does, I'm fully aware with age and time that sometimes I say very stupid or insensitive things, and sometimes harmful things. I can tell you with age, too, that the amount of malice I have is, is so much less than it used to be, and my intentions of hurting anybody are, are, is virtually zero, but it's amazing how you still sometimes say the wrong thing at the wrong time and the wrong way to the wrong person and woo, wow you got a problem well yeah the tongue it's interesting how he starts out this passage in verse 2 when he says if anyone does not stumble in what he says he is a perfect man able to bridle the whole body as well 
Well, that's obviously a goal, but not something that we can attain in this life. So what is the point of talking about this idea of never stumbling or being a perfect man or able to bridle the whole body all the time without error? I don't think it's there to shame us into thinking that, well, since I can't do this, might as well not bother. No, I think what he's saying is the closer you get to this, the more you master your tongue, the more you have control of everything in a good way. The more or the less likely you are to wreck everything else. I was having a conversation with my eight-year-old uh, the other day uh, because he's got quite a mouth. <laughs> uh oh, the apple does not fall far from the tree, does it? And I was explaining to him that you might be right, but if you're not nice, nobody's going to care. Like, you're, nobody's going to follow you. Nobody's going to want to be your friend if you're not nice. You might be right, but if you're not nice, it really doesn't matter. And that's because everything else, and I think this is the point that James is making here about the ships and the rudders and the whole body and the horse's mouths, is that the tongue is the rudder of our lives. As I told my eight-year-old, the pen is mightier than the sword. That's an old piece of wisdom that the Bible mirrors here. Uh, or you might say the wisdom mirrors the Bible. But our tongue determines so much. And as I've aged, and the more I've understood that, the more careful I am. In Genesis chapter 1, we're told that we're made in the image of God. And we also have a unique characteristic among all of God's creation that only we human beings have. And that is speech, you know, the way we understand speech. Other animals talk and garble and, and communicate to some degree, but only human beings have speech. And such a complicated language and the ability to abstract ideas and reading and writing and what we've done with language in our species history largely speaking has defined the history i mean even to this day to pass a law you've got to put it in language and write it down and there has to be a signature on it by the leader of that country or province to put it into effect we, through our everyday lives, recognize the value and the meaning of words. And so, when we discuss the tongue, and we've got some more to read here from James, and it's not going to be easy to read, but when we discuss the tongue, we're talking about the rudder that steers the whole ship. And I recognize, as a preacher and a teacher, that so much of what I say stirs, steers the whole church. I actually have no ability to force anything but I know that just my influence through my tongue alone is strong and I am accountable for that unto God and it is no small thing let's keep reading end of verse 5 see how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire and the tongue is a fire the very world of iniquity the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men, who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh water. We thought the first part of the passage was convicting. The second part of the passage is the part that I meant when I say it hurts. Another aspect of being human is that with our 
tongues. We don't just communicate and make abstract thought and get things done. We can also accomplish great good and we can also accomplish great evil. And nobody is immune from this. There is not a single innocent person on the planet with their tongue. Oftentimes, in preaching and teaching, the conversation turns to gossip. And most certainly, we need to talk about gossip and, and discuss how terrible it is. But I've been thinking a lot about gossip. Where does gossip originate? Before it gets out of our mouths and goes into somebody else's ear, it comes from our mind and our heart. There's a conscious decision to say something destructive about another human being, or maybe even a fellow church member. Now I have to say, I am extraordinarily blessed to be in a church where I hear very little of this and it's really not much of a problem at all. And that is not to be taken for granted. Very grateful for that. No such thing as perfect with this, but uh, overall, pretty great. When it comes to not just our local church, though, I think about our lives and I think about our families and our friends. And I think about people that we don't like. Everybody's got somebody they don't like. Some people have a lot more than others, but everybody's got somebody. And let me tell you something I've been talking to my teenagers about. And I think it's very important. This is something I've learned with age and time. And that is, no matter who it is, no matter what they've done to you, you never want to continue thinking ill of them. You have to forgive them in your heart, and you have to let it go. If you let, and the old term is a grudge, and maybe that's a useful term for somebody who's listening to this, but I want to define that. If there's anybody in your heart that you let get you riled up, lets you get angry, lets you sort of curse the sky, you haven't forgiven that person yet. Maybe you think you have, but you haven't. You haven't let it go. In Revelation chapter 6, even the martyrs cry out unto God for their vengeance, but they don't seek vengeance themselves. Whatever anybody has done to you that is wrong, you have to trust God will deal with it, and you have to let it go. I know how hard this is. I know some people listening to this how hard that is, but it truly is the only answer. Because think about the alternative. The alternative, look at verse 6 again, is that the tongue sets on fire the entire course of our life and is set on fire by hell. When people wrong us or we wrong others, it's a tragedy. And there's real consequences, sometimes lifelong tragedy. And to some degree, tragedy is inevitable. We're all going to make mistakes and we're all going to be victims of those mistakes sometimes. But there's a difference between tragedy and, as the verse here says, being set on fire by hell. There's a difference between tragedy and hell. We can make things much worse and last much longer than if we can learn to forgive. And you can get into a discussion and an argument, and I've heard you know every version of this. Well, you can forgive, but you never forget. Well... I've never found forgetting to be a voluntary action. I don't know about you, but my brain remembers whatever it wants to remember, and it forgets whatever it wants to forget. I don't think I need to make a conscience effort to remember something terrible somebody did to me. I think what I can do is do my best to put it out of my mind, forgive that person, and move on with my life. My brain will do plenty of remembering without me dwelling on it. we got to let things go. And it's probably one of the hardest lessons of growing into an adult and then being that adult over time. I say this as somebody who still works with youth and has teenagers in my home and will always hope to work with youth and try to help kids grow up and serve the Lord and find joy in that. And one of the ways that you can make sure you never have peace and joy in your heart is to continue hating people who've done you wrong. You have to let them go. All right, I think we've 
said enough about that. Well, the rest of the passage talks about how we can say good things about some people and, and bad things about other people, and this comes out of the same mouth, and how we're unique in nature in that we can do this. That from the fountain of our mouth, from the same opening, comes both fresh and bitter water. I was thinking about that passage in the Gospels where Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are all concerned with what people are eating. And Jesus says, it's not the things that go into a man's mouth that makes him unclean, but the things that come out of his mouth, referring to his or her speech. Boy, there's a lot to be said about that, isn't there? Even in our modern times, people are so concerned about diet. And I'm not saying diet isn't important. I'm trying to diet. I'm trying to lose weight. <laughs> it's a constant struggle for me. But I do have to remember what's the more important value. Even though dieting is important and what we eat matters, what's more important is what comes out of my mouth in terms of speech. What matters is what I say and who I say it and how I say it and what I'm saying. And I don't think near enough attention is spent on that than is the other. Like I said, this is a convicting lesson. It hurts at times. But at the same time, it's sort of a good hurt. It's a hurt that I know I need. Maybe it's a hurt that you need to be reminded how important it is what we say and why it matters. And if we choose to say something negative about somebody else, that that could carry a very, very high cost. Let me talk about one thing before we close here. Something else I've discussed with my teenagers at length is this idea that you not only don't want to hold grudges, you not only don't want to hate somebody in your heart, you've got to let them go, you've got to forgive them, and let your brain do the remembering, but otherwise you put it out of your mind. You also don't want to burn bridges. There's a story in my family's past, and I don't know all the details, and I'm going to be really vague about it, but about, oh, 70 years ago or so, there was a doctor who really wronged uh, one of my family members and caused uh, another family member to die as a result of his malpractice. And this family member had the choice and the right to sue this person, but he decided not to. There was nothing to be gained. The family member was gone. No amount of money was going to cure the hurt. My family member had plenty of money. That wasn't going to solve anything. He did file a complaint. He did receive an apology. But he decided not to sue. Years later, and I'm talking probably 20 years later, same relative had a child go into the ER and wouldn't you know that same doctor that had wronged him was the ER doctor that night and had to help his child. And he did. And the child was okay. And they both had an emotional reunion over it. And he said, you know, if you had sued me, I may not be here right now. I may not be able to help people right now. What I did was wrong. It was a poor judgment call. But thank you. And my relative, who had forgiven this man and had moved on, was very grateful for this man's service. And it's amazing how 20 years later, there was healing. 20 years later, there was peace. That tragedy hadn't turned into hell. I hope you can understand that. That if we can control our tongues, if we can act with love and peace and joy even to those who hate us even to those who hurt us if we can forgive truly forgive and let go of those pains who knows what God can do who knows what he can accomplish anything is possible now it takes two to tango it takes two people willing to set the past aside and that's another thing I've I've come to realize, too, if you do try to reconcile with somebody, sometimes you can't figure out the past 
sometimes you both just have to agree to put it behind you and start out fresh. Like that really is the only answer. That you two see the past very differently, potentially, and nothing's going to change your mind, but you're willing to set that aside and have whatever positive relationship you can have. That can work too. There doesn't have to be a resolution of things that are already resolved. Do you understand what I'm saying there? You don't have to agree on everything that happened before to have reconciliation now. You can just simply agree to forgive and to move on. And if you can do that, good things can happen. Great things can happen. I've seen that before. So never burn bridges. Don't ever turn down friendship. Maybe you'll never be really close to this person. You most certainly shouldn't tell them your deepest, darkest secrets. But can you be pleasant? Sure. Can you be kind? Sure. Can you do good things together? Sure. And why not let it be that way? Why not? Who knows what God can do? And that's something else I've been thinking about during this whole quarantine thing, is it's hard to know what the purpose of all this is. But I do know one thing. God has a purpose for everybody he loves. That Romans 8.28 is not invalid. That to all who love the Lord... He's got a plan. And I'm very curious how he is going to continue working in this kind of environment. But one thing's for sure, I know he will. I know that good will come from this. And I'm looking forward to seeing the results. I know that when we can meet again in person, when we can go back to the church building, when we can reassemble, when we can have a church dinner, <laughs> when we can... Uh, go back to doing our activities we're not going to take them for granted at all anymore and I know how easy it is to just get in the routine and take it for granted and boy we're not going to do that are we I know one thing for sure that's going to be one positive thing that's going to come out of this is that we're never going to take that for granted again because we remember how long and how miserable it was to be without the things we took for granted something else kind of silly <laughs> I was telling my wife this like, you know, I, I'll admit, I like to go to the Chinese buffet about once a month. And, and I don't actually overeat at the Chinese buffet. I, I kind of have the things that I get and then I'm done. But I really like it. And I don't even have to go with anybody. I like it so much, I can sit there by myself and just enjoy it. Now, of course, I love going with somebody. But it's actually so good to me that I can sit there as an extrovert by myself and just enjoy what I enjoy at the Chinese restaurant. And I can't do that now. And as silly as it sounds... I missed that. And I took it for granted. It was always there. It was always open. When I could go, I could go. And I usually, believe it or not, and this is going to sound funny, I usually go at like 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, I don't know why. I just like that time. The food isn't as fresh. But there's nobody in line. I don't have to fight anybody to get to anything. I can get in and get out. I mean, I can eat what I like to eat and get out in like 10 minutes. It's no big deal. And they also give you a discount if you go in the middle of the afternoon. So for like 7 bucks a month, I really have this enjoyable 10 minutes that's sort of just for me. And I, I can't do that right now. I miss it. I miss it. I just do. Something silly and little like that, I miss it. Well, let me tell you one more funny story before I close up here. <laughs> this happened yesterday. All right, so... I go to town just to make a deposit in the bank. And all I'm going to do is go through the drive-thru and go straight home. That's all I did. Except I saw there were some cars in the Taco Bell parking lot. and Or in the, talk, in, in the Taco Bell drive-thru, I'm sorry. And I thought to myself, oh, you know what? That little dollar thing of nachos they sell that's like six Weight Watchers points. And it's only like a dollar. Ooh, I want that. <laughs> I want that really bad. So I thought, okay, I'll spend a dollar. So I go through the drive-thru. I spend my dollar eight or whatever it is to get my triple layer nachos, which is nothing more than a few chips, a little cheese, and some red sauce, like some tomato sauce. But it's really good. And I'm going down the road, and I don't want to wait until I get home to eat it. So while I'm driving down the road, I decide to get it out of the bag. And wouldn't you know, I spill it all over myself and my car. <laughs> I can't even believe it happens when it happened. Like, it was just so surreal that I was holding this thing I was really looking forward to, and then a second later, it's just all over the place. And I'm covered in it. And I'm driving down the highway. So, <laughs> I guess I'm just going to have to wait <laughs> to 
to enjoy any kind of takeout until this thing is over. So I told my wife, I was like, well, obviously I learned my lesson. And, you know, if you're dumb enough to try to eat nachos while you drive, I guess you get what's coming to you. And, you know, I did. So, learn my lesson there. All right, there's your funny preacher story for the day. I think I have one just about every week, don't I? Just some silly thing that I do that God teaches me. So, there you have it. Don't eat nachos in the drive-thru. Uh, don't go anywhere you're not supposed to right now. <laughs> Stay at home. Take care of yourself and each other. Try to make some funny memories. Uh, my boys and I tomorrow are going to try to cut up a tree in the yard. Uh, chop a tree down with, with a chainsaw. That should be entertaining. Uh, if I'm missing a limb next week, at least you know what happened. Fair enough. All right. Well, it was great joining you. I'll see you at worship here in just a little while. All right. God bless.